I think we are all here and we are ready to start. So the second speaker of this morning is uh, Pierre Sekiri from uh, University of Florida. And uh, he will uh, give a talk on action bose time condensation. Thank all right, you, so uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk and thank you for coming. So this is work done uh, in collaboration with Charlie Yang, Oscar Erken, Hewitt Ham, Nilanian Danik, Elisa Todorello, Anka Chakrabarti, Yachi Han, and Anthony Gonzalez over the last 15 years or so. Uh, I think it's perhaps getting more and more recognized there is such a phenomenon as Bosenstein condensation. But I would say that there's a lot of confusion in the literature and also some level of controversy. So I'm just talking about that which I believe to be correct. Okay. The thing that I would like to say uh, is that it's two things, actually that dark matter axioms are different from other forms of cold dark matter like WIMS or sterile neutrinos in that they make a Bose-Einstein condensate. That's first thing. And the second thing is that actually the difference is in principle observable. And there's actually a third thing is that I would claim that the evidence in fact uh, supports the idea that Axions of the dark matter because they are form a Bose Einstein condensate. And this is revealed in the study of the inner caustics of galactic halos. I'm making no assumption other than the QCD axion. As you know very well, axions are special in the sense that they have both a thermal distribution and a volt distribution. And the difference is that at QCD time, which I call T1, which is of order 10 to the minus seven seconds, when the temperature is about one GeV, the hot population has momenta of order GeV, whereas the cold population has momenta of order the horizon at QCD time, which is much smaller by roughly 18 orders of magnitude. Cold axions are produced at that time by the so-called vacuum realignment process, where the axion field begins to oscillate. Uh, this is very well known. The density of axions produced is increasing when the axion mass is decreasing and roughly accounts for the dark matter of the universe when the axion mass is of order 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six EV with, however, very large uncertainties. This, this population of cold axions has uh, somewhat extraordinary properties. It's extremely cold. You can estimate the number density at the time. Uh, this is the line in green. And of course, that number density goes down like the uh, scale factor cubed. You can estimate the velocity dispersion from the momentum dispersion, which is given by the QCD horizon. And that also goes down like the scale factor. What's invariant is the phase space density, the number density in physical space divided by the volume in momentum space. And in units of H bar, this number is huge, it's like 10 to the 61. I think it's the most, most highly degenerate fluid ever conceived of. If axions were to never interact and simply uh, expand, and let's say the universe is homogeneous because that's the simplest case to look at, then we know their number density today would be about 10 to the 8 per centimeter cubed. 
and we know their momentum dispersion for the reason I said, and therefore their velocity dispersion. The velocity dispersion is of order 30 centimeters per year. They move as little as the continents on Earth. But it is not correct to think of these axions as moving 30 centimeters per year like this, because they are, their positions are very uncertain by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So if you look at the minimum uncertainty given this momentum dispersion, it is of order a light here, some fraction of a light here. So this uh, axon fluid should certainly be think as a form of uh, a wave dark matter. So we may ask whether this highly degenerate axon dark matter behaves the same way as we usually think of WIMP or sterile neutrinos behave. So here have WIMPs, if I look at the, their density from the same information, uh, it's of order one per meter cubed, depending on the mass. And we can est estimate their momentum dispersion because the WIMPs actually are in kinetic equilibrium, equilibrium with the neutrinos still the photon temperatures of, of order one MeV. And uh, so this gives us the momentum dispersion of the WIMPs today and therefore a velocity dispersion as a function of axon mass. And this, uh, excuse, as a function of WIMP mass, excuse me. And that is of order 10 to the minus 12, the speed of light, which is kilometers per year or roughly uh, 10 to the five times more velocity dispersion than the axions. The associated uncertainty in the position of a WIMP is of order 15 micrometers. So WIMPs are truly like particles. They are one meter apart and they occupy 15 micrometers. Another way to say this is that they are highly non-degenerate in phase space the quantum degeneracy is of order 10 to the minus 13. Now I claim that uh, you should think of these two kinds of dark matter essentially differently. Even though they are both forms of cold dark matter having very small velocity dispersion, they are different in the following sense. Let's suppose that we have some glob I don't know, some glob of dark matter that we are looking at from this position X naught. Uh, I draw the glob as a ellipsoid because it's easy on PowerPoint. <laughs> and I give it sharp edges because that's also easy on PowerPoint, but that's not essential to the argument. If you have such a glob uh, and it is of order in size and light years, then uh, the number of whims making it is 10, 10 to the 47. And each, uh, each has position, significant position differing by micrometers. So in other words, you can construct this glob with whims with tremendous precision. And so here is a glob reconstructed in WIMPs, even much better than the picture shows. In contrast, if you try to make this glob with axions, you cannot reproduce it exactly. I took the size to be of order light here because that is just a little bit bigger than the expected correlation length of the axon fluid given its momentum dispersion. So there are 10 to the 62 axons in this glob, but there's 10 to 61 axons per state. So in other words, there's only 30 states that the axons can occupy. I, I represent this, sorry for the crudeness of my cartoon, by little circles. Each circle is supposed to be a possible axion state and there's of order 30 such states. So what does that mean? First of all, you cannot reproduce this arbitrary 
uh, mass distribution perfectly on this scale. But also the correlation length in the axion fluid is of order the inverse of the momentum dispersion. I don't think I need to explain this, but I'll do it anyway. So the axion field in the non-relativistic limit is described by a wave function. By the way, this is a representation of the classical axon field. The fact that there's a wave function, which you usually associate with quantum mechanics, let it not confuse you. When you describe the axon field by a wave function, you're strictly doing classical field theory. Okay, but in the quantum field, in the quantum fluid, the axons occupy a certain number of states of order 30 for this glob, and each one is described by a wave function. So if the momentum dispersion is delta P, then the correlation in the density is of order, the correlation length in the density is of order one upon delta P. This is easy to see because the density is given by this formula. And if P and P prime can only vanish, uh, sorry, not uh, have to be within a distance delta P. That means that this phase does not change when X uh, varies by one upon delta P. So that means that the fluid has to be necessarily correlated given its momentum dispersion on the length one upon delta P. Now, if that's so, well, it is so, I think it's logical then uh, you must expect very large fluctuations in the gravitational field that the axion fluid produces. Aside from its average value, the fluctuation in the gravitational field is of order four pi g, the density times the correlation length. Because if something is a density rho and correlation length l, then of course it produces the gravitational field. So to make the contrast with WIMPs, let me consider the homogeneous universe. The homogeneous universe is a, a useful laboratory. It's simple, right? It's homogeneous, and one will less easily get confused by talking about it. So in the WIMP case, the gravitational field is zero. If you're in a homogeneous universe and you're sitting in it, there's no gravitational field on you. And in the axion case, there's no gravitational field on you on average. In the WIMP case, it's also true on average, but the fluctuations are extremely small. Whereas in the axon case, the fluctuations are given by the formula at the top. So let me assume as I did originally, that the axion momentum distribution in this homogeneous universe did not change since QCD time. So we estimated its momentum dispersion, but the fluid produces gravitational fields, delta G, and therefore forces on each axon, M delta G. And if this is the momentum dispersion, then by Newton's, second law, this is the time scale over which all the, each axion will change its momentum by order the momentum dispersion. So in other words, that's a time scale in which the whole distribution gets re rearranged completely there at 100% level. Is there a question? Uh, feel free to. So this was question, uh, isn't the field oscillating over the entire universe? Yes, it's oscillating and fluctuating. Yes. So when you go to the wave function description, you are removing actually this oscillation. 
right? The, you, ex, you ex, express, I'm sorry, I, I'm going a little fast. You take the axion field and write it in terms of a wave function. This is going to the non-relativistic limit. You actually remove the oscillation associated with the axion mass. And you're just talking about the deviations from that, really. You're most welcome. Okay, so in 24 seconds, you can put the numbers in there. This today, if it didn't never, never formalize before, it would do it today in 24 seconds in the homogeneous universe. So that really means it happened way before. And Charlie Yang and I, I think, were the first to point this out uh, 14 years ago. And we just compared uh, this formula for the relaxation rate, the time scale over which the, uh, uh, the distribution changes completely, the inverse of that should be called the relaxation rate. Uh, the same as, as I was describing, compared with the age of the universe then, okay, uh, given by the Hubble rate. So the ratio gamma over H tells you whether the axion fluid is thermalizing. And it is not thermalizing at QCD time. So at QCD time, you can really say that every axion stays in whatever uh, state that is in. And the thermalization rate is suppressed by factors 10 to the minus seven compared to the Hubble rate. But notice that the thermalization rate, because the density goes down like eight to the minus three, but the correlation rate goes, down, goes up like A. So the thermalization rate goes down like the scale factor, whereas the Hubble rate goes down like the scale factor square. So both go down, but the Hubble rate down goes faster and they cross at some point. And we estimated that this time, this happens when the photon temperature is of order half a kV or so. So what happens then? Well, I think I wasn't there, I didn't see, neither were you. So we have to just follow the rules of physics. If you have a fluid that's highly degenerate and it thermalizes and the number of particles is conserved, then it makes a Bose-Einstein condensate. What that means is, thermalization means that you go to distributions of ever-increasing entropy. Einstein pointed out that the state of highest entropy in these conditions is one where you put all the particles in the lowest energy available state. The energy, st the lowest energy available state. And you establish a thermal distribution above that. So I say the same thing here. If you have identical bosons, they're highly degenerate, the total number is conserved and they thermalize, they all go to the lowest energy available state. That is the lowest energy available state through these thermalizing interactions. You know that thermal equilibrium is tricky. I think Feynman said, and is one of his memorable phrases, thermal equilibrium is where every, when everything that happens quickly has happened many times over and everything that happens slowly has not happened yet. I think it seems like obvious, right? But actually, uh, I think if you keep that in mind, it will clarify a lot of issues that occur when you're talking about thermal, thermal equilibrium. I had prepared this question to you that no matter how you answer it, I would agree or disagree according to my mood. <laughs> is whether a star is in thermal equilibrium. If you say, no, I would agree, because the star is not at a constant temperature. And one of the, the first ingredients for thermal equilibrium is that temperature be uniform. But if you say it is in thermal equilibrium, I would agree, yes. And that's a very powerful concept as Alessandro showed, because it's a local phenomenon. 
when you look at the local thermalization, it doesn't care about the long time evolution of the star. So you have similar issues here and you have to be careful. On the time scale of order of the Hubble rate, the universe changes, density perturbations will grow. But on the time scale of order tor, which is much shorter now after this uh, temperature of order 500 TV, the axion fluid will re-thermalize and the condensate will adjust to the situation it is in by seeking the lowest energy state that it can find. So my next statement is gonna be that you should expect the possibility of the generation of vorticity in the axon fluid when this is possible because the axions can move from states between states of different vorticity by, by changing, for example, from a state of angular momentum three to nine, plus a state of angular momentum four to one, when this angular momentum is conserved, but the axons move between states of different vorticity. Now, vorticity is not the uh, word I had to learn this word. <laughs> Maybe it's useful. What do I mean by vorticity? If you have a closed curve, which I drew last night, it's not very well done, but let's say it's a closed curve. It doesn't have to be smooth, actually. If you integrate the, if you look at the circulation of the velocity, that is the vorticity associated with this closed curve. And by a famous theorem, this is the same as the flux of the curl of V through the surface and, cl and closed. Generation of vorticity is impossible with wim dark matter because wim dark matter satisfies the Euler equation for the wim dark matter fluid is given there. The time derivative of the velocity field following the motion is the gradient of the Newtonian potential. And that's a gradient. And you can show in a page or so that if the wimp uh, initial fluid has no uh, vorticity, then it will never acquire vorticity. And it does not have initial vorticity because the rotational modes are damped by the expansion of the universe. And, okay. So now, if you have a classical wave dark matter, that is, uh, like often described. So the dark matter is described by an ax by a by a scalar field. And you go to the non-relativistic limit. Then the Euler equation is actually like WIMS, ex except it is an extra term, which is the uh, gradient of what's called the quantum pressure. Confusingly called the quantum pressure. Uh, first of all, it doesn't have the dimension of pressure. It's dimensionless, as you can see from the equation. And it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics uh, because it has to do with the wave nature of the fluid and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It just expresses the fact that if you try to put all the fluid in one location, you must give it momentum dispersion and it will uh, disperse but you see, because it's also a gradient, uh, the associated force is also a gradient. You do not produce vorticity if you have classical, uh, classical field description of the dark matter. But I'm claiming you should not describe the axon fluid as a classical field on time scales longer than the thermalization time scale. When the axon field thermalizes because it's a Bose-Einstein condensate, what you should expect, it goes to the lowest energy state as is consistent with any angular momentum that it may have acquired. And that is a state of rigid rotation. State of rigid rotation does have vorticity. So for emphasis, a quantum scalar field differs from cold dark matter on time scales longer than a thermal 
I should say, yes, okay, quantum scalar field differs from ordinary cold dark matter, either described by WIMS or by a classical scalar field on time scales longer than its relaxation time. So you have a homogeneous background and you are saying that nevertheless the axion field which is collisionless in this homogeneous background can acquire net vorticity. Uh, okay, so is it net vorticity or the different vorticities cancel out and you have zero overall? Yeah, that should be a thank you for this question, okay. which is in the homogeneous universe that I was discussing, does the axion field acquire vorticity? And thank you for this clarification. I did not mean that. In the homogeneous universe, there's no such vorticity. The vorticity will only appear when uh, through uh, tidal talking, you produce angular momentum. So thank you for this clarification, okay. So uh, I want to emphasize that this behavior has nothing to do with loops. When I was taught quantum field theory, I was told that loop corrections or quantum mechanical tree graphs are uh, classical. Uh, that statement is actually not correct. <laughs> the correct statement is that the loop expansion is an expansion in powers of edge bar. That's easy to show. But it's not true that all quantum effects are in loops. The effect that I'm talking about has nothing to do with loops, but has to do with quantum statistics. The difference in behavior, say, uh, of the quantum photon fluid, which has a Planck distribution, versus that of the classical photon fluid, which has a Raleigh uh, genes spectrum, which has a ultraviolet catastrophe. In classical mechanics, we say every uh, mode has equal energy, there's equal partition, but that's not true in the quantum fluid. So that's a difference in quantum statistics it has nothing to do with loops. No, I think that this stuff is pretty, uh, seems pretty compelling to me that you should not expect uh, the, when, when, the, when the system uh, thermalizes, you should not expect the classical system and quantum system. Yes, sorry, I have a question to the previous uh, claim, just the previous slide. So essentially, when you are talking, I'm not talking about quantum loops. I want to know what's happening with the vorticity in a global sense, because what we, when you say vorticity emerges, it means that essentially you are changing the boundary conditions at a very large distances. Is it correct my understanding that actually the producing of vorticity implies that boundary conditions are changing, or it is not correct my understanding? Okay, the question is, is it correct to say that when the vorticity changes, the boundary condition is changing at infinity? And the answer to this, as far as I can tell, is that it is changing in the classical field theory. That is to say, every state, every wave function has a vorticity that you cannot change unless you change the boundary conditions at infinity, as you're saying, or unless you bring in a vortex. But I'm emphasizing that in the quantum fluid, the axons move between wave functions with different vorticity. And so you can change the vorticity in the quantum field, in the, the fluid described by the quantum fluid. For example, okay. mm, Still, I want to clarify. When I say you change vorticity, 
you just take the boundary conditions, you take the integral at a very, very large distances, and it must stay the same. If you, you are talking about specific quantum field theory with a specific boundary conditions, and you quantize your field with a given boundary conditions, or you are talking about some different, not canonical ensemble, but something else. No, I, I'm saying, uh, let's not take the boundary conditions at infinity. Let's just consider this process, which I think you agree, hopefully, is allowed. Axion, axion scattering with uh, different states of angular momentum, three plus five goes to two plus six. This is allowed in the quantum theory. Axions jump between different states and the vorticity changes. What you're referring to is that the, the state, the vorticity of a classical state, classical wave function cannot change. But in the quantum theory, the axons jump between states and therefore can change vorticity. Okay, but what it means normally when you are talking about classical uh, cl classical wave function, what it means you consider coherent uh, uh, coherent superposition in terms of quantum states. When you say change the quantum state, means that your coherent wave function is different now after this process. So coherent state, it is a superposition of quantum states. Now I consider coherent state as a classical wave function. Very good. It's exactly what I am doing all the time. Now your wave function, coherent wave function is different because essentially superposition is different now. No, no. You're talking about the coherence of the state of one oscillator. So if you talk about one oscillator, it can be in a coherent state, right? Or not coherent state. Actually, that's irrelevant to this discussion. What I'm talking about is that you have many oscillators and the quanta jump from one oscillator to another. Okay. So I'm going slowly over this, but I think that these things are, uh, uh, if you want to understand, in my mind, if you want to understand the behavior of the axon fluid correctly, you have to worry about these things. So where was I? So I think it is pretty clear that the behavior of a quantum system and a class classical system must differ on the time scale of its thermal relaxation because of the quantum statistics being different from classical statistics. But to see this in reality, Elisa Todarello and I did some a toy model with qu five quantum oscillators in which we put 50 quanta. I know it's not very big, but it's the best sort of what you can do on a, on a computer. So uh, here's the Hamiltonian, it has interactions. This is very important. If you don't have interactions, you don't have thermalization. And the interactions of a certain type, which actually reflects the fact that the action fluid is in so-called thermal thermalizing in what we call the condensed state. Okay, I don't have time to explain that in detail, but we have 50 quanta amongst five states and that allows of all the 300,000 system states. And we start, for example, with 20 quanta in the first state, five, 15, five, five. So I'm talking about the quanta jumping between states, okay? So uh, the number of particles is 50, the total energy is 120, and you can calculate what is the thermal average. It's actually not a Bose distribution because this is not in the thermodynamic limit. The number of particles is too small for that. So with this initial state, we solved the Schrodinger equation. We calculated the time evolution of the occupation numbers of the five states. And we asked, does it thermalize on the predicted time scale? 
And you can estimate using the same methods as we use for the axon fluid that the time scale is of order one. And it does, in fact. This is where the time scale over which it should terminalize. And you see that the first oscillator, which is the blue line, goes from 20 to its thermal average on that time scale. And the green line goes to its thermal average. The thermal averages are shown by the points on the right, and it does it on the correct time scale. We also looked at the classical behavior. The classical behavior is given here. Now you see that initially the classical behavior is similar to the quantum behavior, like the green line first goes down, the blue line first goes up, uh, this line first goes down, and so forth. But it never thermalizes. These are actually what's supposed to be the classical uh, oscillator averages given by uh, equipartition. So what do you learn? The system, quantum system thermalizes on the affected, on the expected time scale. The classical system actually does not thermalize even if you wait very long time. This is actually not news. Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam, when computers were first came to the fore, uh, tried this problem of looking at a number of interacting classical oscillators and found that they don't terminate. They were surprised, and I guess we were a little bit surprised too. But I think we understand that the reason this does not happen is that if you have five classical oscillators, the um, the energy sloshes back and forth between these oscillators too coherently. Okay, it doesn't, the fluctuations are very large. So the classical system, also the classical system does not track the quantum system. Okay, so I have, yes, please. Uh, So in this uh, system uh, of uh, oscillators, uh, how one can be sure that uh, the result is not influenced by the small size? So, I mean, typically in this problem, sometimes it happens that few modes uh, ensemble be a very different from uh, many modes. So uh, also how the thermalization is affected by the number of modes. Yeah, so we were limited by you know, the computer size, basically. If you go, you can, we did make uh, larger numbers than 50 up to 100 and so forth, 150, I think even, but the behavior was always the same. Then we ran out of computing power. But I think that when you look at this, it does seem to do very much to behave like expected. Every oscillator after oscillating a little bit goes to its, expected thermal average. So I feel, first of all, that's what, what we expected and that's what it does. So Alessandro, if you're skeptical, that's very good. Every scientist should be skeptical. No, no, is that typically, I mean, this sort of problem, sometimes uh, it, uh, the number of modes plays a role, but uh... Of course, we, you are limited because you cannot extrapolate. Uh... Yes, we did some extrapolations increasing the number of particles. And there's actually much more to be said about this. We found that the behavior does not change with the number of particles. It behaved exactly with saying that it is a quantum system that terminalizes. And we also tried coherent states, by the way. You can put the, here we start with eigenstates of the occupation number. We also build coherent states, but they thermalize just at the same rate as the eigenstates of momentum. They, maybe they, their classical behavior is a little longer, but in the, in the long run, they also deviate from the classical uh, behavior on, on the time scale of thermalization. Okay, so 
Here is my cartoon of uh, tidal torque theory. So I'm not very good. So this is supposed to be our galaxy. This is supposed to be a neighbor like M31 very early in the history of the universe when they're relatively close. Tidal torque theory says that the galaxy will typically acquire angular momentum because it has inhomogeneities. And for example, the glob at the top being bigger and closer to its neighbor than this glob and being smaller and further away, the torque is this way. And actually, if you look at the distribution of angular momenta over all galaxies, there's very good agreement with this picture. The expect, you can uh, evaluate ex, uh, the, the expected typical angular momentum, and it is very much what you observe, consistent with what you observe. Now, if you do this with WIMPs, because they are WIMPs, they go where they're told to go. The, where they go is the little green line. They go uh, according to the gravitational field, which is a gradient. And this is a picture showing that the WIMP distribution, velocity distribution will remain a rotational. The curl will remain zero. But this is what I like about them. Axions don't go where they're told to go. The fields tell them to go according to the red lines, but the axions returnalize, they interact amongst themselves, and they go to the lowest energy state consistent with the angular momentum acquired. And that is a state of rotation. The lowest energy state for given angular momentum is actually a state of rigid rotation and therefore a state with vorticity. So this is also in, in response to Subir's question. Uh, so this vorticity appears with tidal talking. Now, what difference does it make from an observational viewpoint? Here, I consider a topological sphere of particles, dark matter, and assume that it has rotation. And uh, this picture is supposed to show that it will make a caustic ring. Okay, you have to go through the sequence A, B, C, D, E, F. Basically what happens is the sphere falls to the galactic center, the top falls down, the bottom falls up, the particles near the equator fall in and they fall back out. The caustic actually appears here and there or near there where there's a crease. Before in C there's no caustic, but the caustic appears there and there. Now, of course, this phenomenon, the crease appears for this particular sphere at a given time, but you have to keep in mind that the one shell follows another shell. So the, actually the crease is a permanent uh, feature of space. So here's a picture of a sphere turning inside out and uh, it makes a crease. And I'm saying there's a caustic at the crease. So this caustic uh, is, is a particular catastrophe uh, or singularity, maybe is a better word. And it has a particular shape. It's a ring shown here with axial symmetry, but the axial symmetry is not important. The cross section of this ring is given here. So it has this shape. And actually this shows the, um, there's some kind of pointer here.
Oh, the stick is better. Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> Immediately gives me some level of authority, which. <laughs> okay, this you might call the envelope of the trajectories. This is uh, where the density formally diverges. It diverges in the limit of zero velocity dispersion. And this is a non-catastrophe called the elliptic umbilic. This is a picture of it as a, as a, <laughs> a bracelet. So to give you an idea, but I want you to realize that this bracelet is entirely different from what I'm talking about. Because I can take the bracelet and break it, but you cannot break the caustic ring. This is because you cannot break a rainbow. A rainbow is also a caustic in the propagation of sunlight. And you can hit the rainbow with a cannonball or whatever, but it will just reappear. So the same is true for this uh, caustic ring. If you disturb it, like maybe by a star coming by, it will get disturbed. That is to say, when the star is nearby, the, the flow will be disturbed. That is true. But when the star has gone through, the flows will reestablish themselves, like a, you know some feature in a flow in the river. Also, this picture by Arvind Natarayan shows that this structure is stable. That is to say, if you have no axial symmetry, a more complicated infall, you still have a ring, and that still its cross section remains this elliptic umbilic. Now, if you have ordinary CDM like WIMS, then the uh, velocity field remains irrotational and you still make an inner caustic. That is to say, when the whims fall in and out, they still make an inner caustic. You always must make an inner caustic, but it is different. And I'm now going to claim that there's evidence for the kind of caustic made by axions. So that's why I claim axions are better. This is the property of any collision that's true. That you get a caustic. That you right. Thank you. Thank you, Sub. Thank you, thank you, Subia. Excellent question because I know the answer. Every collision is cold, cold collision is fluid will make an inner caustic, but the caustic that is formed depends upon the velocity distribution before it falls in. When the, when the velocity distribution is rotation free, you have a caustic that has this kind of structure. When the, uh, oops, when you have rotation, you have a caustic that is this, uh, has this kind of structure. So the difference between axions and whims is that because axions thermalize by gravity before falling in, they go to a state of lowest energy for given angular momentum, they acquire rotation, vorticity, they make this kind of caustic and not, which is different from that of WIMS. That's the logic. Thank you, Subir. This is my next topic. Because I claim there's evidence for these rings. And for that, you have to make some prediction about where they are. And for this, we used a self-similar inform model, originally due to Fillmore and Goldreich and also Birchinger, but the model, original model has no angular momentum. So with Igat Kachov and Yun Wang, we added angular momentum. And then you can predict where these caustic rings are. 
And you find that in our galaxy, they should be at 40 kiloparsec divided by an integer. So 40, 20, 13.3, 10, 8, and so forth. If in another galaxy, you should scale it according to the rotation velocity. And each galaxy has one number, which we call J max. I claim evidence for this. And the evidence uh, is based upon the fact that these rings like lie in the galactic plane. And uh, some of the evidence is based upon the, the line in the galactic plane. And this disturbs the rotation curve of the galaxy. And actually where you have this divergence in the density, you have a kink in the rotation curve. Perhaps the best place to go look is that our neighbor Andromeda. If you look at this rotation curve, of course you may argue with me, but I claim that there is a, a bump here, a bump here and a bump there. And that is qualitatively consistent with caustic rings with the ratios say 30 divided by two is 15, 30 divided by three is 10. If you look at our rotation curve, it is very precisely measured inside the on radius, which is about eight and a half kiloparsec, it's sort of a standard value for our radius, but poorly measured outside. Nonetheless, if you look at the outside rotation curve at around 30.3 kiloparsec, that would be the third caustic ring causes some kind of disturbance in the rotation curve. If you look at our own galaxy, now I'm looking at the inner rotation curve measured in carbon monoxide, which allows much higher resolution as hydrogen. It has a set of rises, and these rises are very sharp, consistent with the kinks caused by caustic rings. They start on one point and end on one point. So I have put all these rises, for example, this one represented by this line, this one by that line. There's some number of rises and they're consistent with the predictions of the models qualitatively. Oops. Let me just try this. Okay, uh, which are shown by the vertical lines. Now here is a little line, the significance of which I'll now explain. Oops. So we are at eight and a half kiloparsec. They're supposed to be a caustic very close to us. I thought since it's very close to us, perhaps we can see it in the tangent direction. And I found such a feature in the IRS map of the galactic plane. I claim there's a triangle here that is consistent with a cross-section. For those of you who don't see it, I put a little dots. But the position of this triangle on the sky is exactly given by this little line. It's consistent with this rise in the rotation curve. Now, people told me, okay, this is fine, but how come you can only show a caustic on one side. How about the other side? So I was delighted to see the map of Gaia, the sky map of Gaia, the galactic plane. Now Gaia actually shows not infrared radiation, but shows starlight. And where you see darkness, you actually see dust, right? Because the starlight doesn't get through. This, this feature here is the triangle on the left. I put a little dot there because I, I, I don't trust you to see it. <laughs> but there's also a triangle on the other side. Okay, without the dust, dots and with the dots. 
Originally, I had thought that the caustic center was at the galactic center. Pardon me. <laughs> but in reality, there's no reason why it should, one should expect it to be exactly the galactic center. Turns out that the right triangle in Gaia is a little bit is such a place so that if you extrapolate and call this a circle, the circle is actually displaced from the galactic center by something like 700 parsec. So there's an angle. Whereas before, with just the iris triangle, I thought the sun was over here someplace. But with the Gaia both triangles, the sun is over here someplace, however, some fairly large uncertainty. When it was outside, there's two cold flows at every location. When it's inside, there's four cold flows. My time is up. And we determined this with Chakrabadi, Yachi Han, and Gonzalez. Oops, oops, where am I? So there's quite a bit to say about this, but uh, we claim to know that the local dark matter density is, is dominated by these four flows. This one is called the big flow, actually has a density some 20 times larger than what you normally quote for the local dark matter density. It's not inconsistent with observation because the, the, the usual quote of one half GeV or so per centimeter cube is all an average of a kiloparsec size. So you can very well have a caustic on a much smaller size. And you have this up, up flows, down flows, and little flow, uh, which, and we know their directions, and they're in the direction of galactic rotation. So thank you for your patience. I, let me just summarize. Axions, I believe, differ from other forms of cold dark matter because they thermalize and form a Bose-Einstein condensate. And secondly, this is observably, observable quantum, uh, consequences. And I claim some evidence for axon dark matter on this basis. So thank you. Well, thank you, Pierre, for this fascinating talk. And uh, are there questions? Thanks for the nice talk. So there's a paper, I think it was in 2014 by Alan Guth and Mark Hertzberg claiming that you do not get long range correlations if you have an attractive interaction like what the Axion does. I'm wondering if you're familiar with that paper, if you can comment on it. Yeah. So they claim you don't get caustics. I read it many times. I disagree with what they say. I think that the confusion is uh, whether you, you should make a distinction between the correlation length of a Bose-Einstein condensate and its scale of inhomogeneity. The correlation length of a Bose-Einstein condensate is actually the size of the Bose-Einstein condensate. And it can be inhomogeneous on a much smaller size. And I think it's just a confusion. That's my, that's my response to that. Okay. And then I have one quick comment. The data you were showing for the Milky Way rotation curve is very old. So there's new data from you know, Gaia to mass um, that is with much reduced air bars. And I believe it matches the, the galactic halo model pretty well. So might be something worth looking into, updating that plot with the newer data. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pierre, I have two questions actually, one about physics and one not about physics. About physics first. So essentially in, uh, in normally when you discuss vortices emerge, we have some kind of topological invariant, something like churn simons or Pantriagin index, whatever you want to call it. But nevertheless, in mathematics, it is a conserved. It cannot be changed. In physics, of course, we know it can. In principle, but we have to know what is the reason for changing of the topological invariant. It's about physics and not about physics. I know that there are actually uh, 
both the condensation, it is a matter of debate. Still, it's a matter of debate. So I, I know your view, uh, and I want to know actually opponents' view as well. So essentially, I want to know why it is a still matter of debates. Okay, thank you. So what is a matter of debate? So uh, both the Einstein condensate, uh, do you have a condensation or you don't? So it is a still people, uh, when people discuss about the axions, it's still some people say it cannot condense. Um, you know, I give that which I believe to be correct, okay? I think it is a confusing topic and I've tried to explain why it is confusing. For example, Ben pointed out many people believe that when you have Bosnach and condensation, it's in a state of zero momentum. I, I think, I don't know, that's not <laughs> what Einstein said, okay? It's only in the state of zero momentum in an infinite box, uh, and there's no, uh, there's no potential, background potential. Uh, that has no, the, the zero momentum state has nothing to do with Bosnach and condensation. Yet, I think this is what Alan Guth was saying because the, you cannot expect it to be homogeneous. You should not expect it to be a Bosnian condensate. I would disagree with that. So I say, uh, when it, it terminalizes, it goes to a lowest energy state available uh, to, the, to the particles, given the context in which it is. And that's not gonna be a state that's homogeneous, but it is a Bose-Einstein condensate in the sense that all the particles go to the same state, almost all the particles go to the same okay. state. Yeah, exactly. Okay, coming back to the topological yeah. Can I explain actually what's happening with, just not with mathematics. I know in mathematics, topological invariant must stay the same. But nevertheless, vorticity is changing in your process. So I want to know how topological invariant is going to be changed, not in mathematics, in physics, what's happening on the right-hand side. So what happens is that every state has its own vorticity. That is to say, every particle state has its vorticity. But the quanta move between states and therefore between states of different vorticity. So it's not inconsistent in the quantum theory to change the vorticity. Is there? A... So you basically said that if you treat, let's say, all non-relativistic physics as a perturbation, you get some observable effect, which will be different in quantum and in classical cup physics after a certain time. Uh, the, there is paper in which uh, Dwali and Cell uh, estimated quantum breaking time in full relativistic system and let's say for usual axion cannot be observed let's say in Hubble patch so in your treatment uh, can for instance can 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 we say that it's real really quantum breaking so it's really difference between classical and quantum system or it's an artifact of non-relativistic approximation and that says that this non-relativistic approximation is not well laid on top of this like global oscillation uh, I don't think uh, whether it's relativistic or not relativistic is, makes a difference. I do say that the quantum break time, which some people use as a time, we call it the duration of classicality, but the notion is right. the same, is much shorter than the age of the universe. And I, I gave the reasons why I think so. Because the, uh, in this cold axion fluid, the uh, gravitational field fluctuates and changes the momentum distribution on a time scale much shorter than the age of the universe. But, but you throw out, let's say, all relativistic effects, you treat the, uh, let's say, fluctuations non-relativistically. So can, for instance, can that, like the short time, can be a sign that Relativity doesn't have enough time, let's say, to make it bigger, like this quantum break time. 
Well, the axon fluid is non-relativistic after the QCD phase transition. So maybe the relativistic effects that change the quantum break time, but I don't think they're relevant to the axon fluid. Now, the axon fluid is non-relativistic after QCD time. Right, that, that is, let's say, non-relativistic if we're looking on average, but the rescattering, let's say, of the constituents quanta is still relativistic inside, right? I'm not sure I got that. Say it again. So if, if we imagine, let's say, that, that fluid, let's say, that, that let's say, coherent fluid from the constituents of the quanta, like off-shell quantas, their scattering is still, still relativistic. That's why I'm asking this question. Uh, so if they're non-relativistic particles, their scattering is a non-relativistic non, non No, they are off-shell. That, that's why I'm asking. They are off-shell, so their scattering should be still a little bit relativistic. So I, I don't, the axon fluid is non-relativistic. There are some a few particles that are relativistic, yes, because I think that's right. Oh, you mean the thermal axions? No, if we take the axion, let, let's say if we take coherent axion, what we usually treat like this with cosine potential and, and et cetera. And in order to take care of quantum effects, if we imagine that it constitutes of off-shell particles, then rescattering of that off-shell particles will be still relativistic. Uh, there will be rescattering, and uh, I think it's correctly described by non-relativistic physics, but of course, relativistic physics is correct too. Non-relativistic physics is an approximation, but right. I don't think so that- the, I'm asking about this validity of that approximation. I expect it to be valid because the axon fluid is in fact non-relativistic. At the classical level, yes. Oh, 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 okay, maybe we can- No, it doesn't matter whether it's classical or quantum, right? It has to do with the typical speed in the fluid. The, actually, what has to do with the typical velocity dispersion in the fluid. Doesn't actually have to do even with how fast it moves. It has to do with the velocity dispersion in the fluid, which is extremely low. I see. Okay. <laughs> so, does it make a difference to your story whether you are in the pre inflationary or post inflationary scenario? Um, yes, this is an interesting question. Uh, I have given the or estimate for the first time of stabilization in what's called the um, post-inflationary scenario, where you have domain walls and things. Um, it's not clear to me that this estimate is correct in the other scenario. Um, we're working on it. Yes. For you, it's very important it is homogeneous. Uh, yes. So and if, if anything, you would think that it forms a Bose-Einstein condensate earlier because the momentum dispersion, it seems to be, is less. But exactly what is the momentum dispersion is not completely clear to me. Uh, with Wei Shui, we wrote a paper about the axon field getting excited during the QCD phase transition as being part of an attempt to say what is its actually momentum distribution after the QCD phase transition is finished. But I think we have not answered all relevant questions. We have sort of have the high momentum part of the spectrum, but I think we are not completely clear about the low momentum part of the spectrum. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. I didn't quite get how can we get, uh, why we are at the center of this caustic ring, why there's not uh, variable sizes. And also how do you say that this caustic ring shape, how variable is the shape depending on, I guess it depends on the initial conditions that you have somehow and the initial vorticity that you input because you, at some point you showed some sort of numerical simulation. I would like to know uh, what is the input that you use to get these shapes? So uh, it, that we are inside 
is an accident. And uh, this is inferred from observation. You would not have expected a priori that we would be in sight. It could be outside, uh, but we could be inside. It's not uh, something that you could have guessed correctly uh, just from thinking, I think, you know, as a theory paper. I think you need to observa observational input. If you, um, the expectation was that there are caustics at 40 kilo per sec divided by an integer. So 40, 20, 13.3, 10, and 8. Actually, if you do it more carefully, I don't know, of course, you know, what all the uncertainties, but the estimate was 8.4. And we are at 8.5. So it's an accident. Any other question from the audience? Yes. I'd, I'd, so I'd make a comment. So, so the idea is we're in the big flow and the big flow has 20 times our expected dark matter density. So, so there are many experiment haloscopes out there and they maybe go to a little bit above KSBZ. They would be quite sensitive, maybe even to DFSC yes. axions. So, so the, the message is keep looking even if you don't get all the way down. Right. That's that's what I would do. But I'm very glad that the haloscopes are as sensitive as you have made them, because it's easy to lose sensitivity, as you know. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> it's very hard work to acquire sensitivity. So yes, but I do think that it's wise to just look over wide range with less, less sensitivity, not lose too much. But yes, I think there's a real discovery potential. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, really quick question. Would you call um, a laser with an intrinsic width a BEC? Would I call a laser a BEC? A with intrinsic width, because no, every system has a loss, so it is bound to have some width. So would you call that a BEC? That's my question. I, I thank you for this question. Uh, I think the word BEC is much abused. Many people call a classical wave a BEC. So if you have a, a call on your cell phone, you are receiving a BEC. I think that's an abuse of language. Actually, you don't need Bose-Einstein conversation to understand that. You just need classical field theory. But your question was about the laser. So once the laser, the light has left the laser, it obeys classical field equations. It's non-interacting. And actually, you don't, if you just look at that light, you may guess it comes from a laser, but there's actually nothing rigorously telling you it comes from a laser. So maybe you're, uh, so what caused the, the, as you know, the, the laser light is the fact that the transition between atoms is stimulated by the background light and more and more light gets put into the same mode of actually an optical cavity and that's the laser light. And you're asking me what I call that the BEC. Well, I think that's a very good question because a lot of confusion in physics has to do with words. But my opinion about that is no better than yours. I, I would not call it the BEC, I think. Uh, but you could argue about it very reasonably, I think. All right, thank you also for that question. So light is in fact collisionless to a very good approximation. It's very difficult to make a BC out of light, but apparently people have succeeded in doing that to make light somehow uh, interact. And I, I read, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but light, you know, flows through, through itself very much like dark matter, but you can enhance its interaction. And apparently people have succeeded in making it form a BC, not, not from a laser, but just from light, I guess, in some medium. Uh, I'm not sure, did I answer your question? No, I think this topic is very rich, actually. And I think it is glossed over and should not be glossed over. 
Other questions? Are there are questions from the audience online? I don't see raised hands. So if not, uh, well, thank you very much uh, for this nice talk. And we